Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today is a big day in the Unreal versus Apple story as overnight, 1 a.m. if you're here on the East Coast of the United States, Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers has issued her first opinion in respect of this case. Now, if you aren't familiar with lawsuits, you should know when I say opinion, this is the first opinion before the first opinion before the first opinion in the case itself. This was actually in response to Epic's request for a temporary restraining order, which is precedent to a request for a preliminary injunction, which is all precedent to what will undoubtedly be Apple's attempt to get the case summarily dismissed. And all that happens really before the lawsuit even commences in earnest. But we start to get an inkling on what these two sides are about, what the judge is about in respect of this case. And if you aren't familiar with the specifics here, we do have a long form playlist now at 10 videos as of making this one. So it will be 11 videos when it is done. And suffice it to say that Epic went out and added a direct payment option to Fortnite that allowed people to pay Epic directly, eschewing entirely the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. They're involved in another lawsuit with Google at the same time as this one. Apple and Google reacted. They took Fortnite off the store. Apple also sent a letter to Epic that said, hey, we are killing your access to all of our software development kits, all of our APIs, including the Unreal Engine, which is your bread and butter in a different business model within your Epic affiliate entities. And Epic said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We want the court to say Fortnite goes back on the store and that Apple can't do anything against Unreal Engine. This was the actual temporary restraining order that they proposed the judge issue in their favor. You can see in the first and second paragraphs here what they want is for Fortnite to be added back to the store as modified to allow direct payment to Epic, eschewing completely Apple's cut, their 30% cut of the of the 100% of dollars coming through the in-app purchasers at Fortnite to prevent Apple from making any changes to Fortnite on their end and then preventing Apple from taking any other adverse action against Epic on the basis that Epic did all this with Fortnite. Now, as we talked about over the weekend, when Epic issued an additional response to this particular temporary restraining order request after Apple had opposed it, Epic does have a fairly good argument with respect to at least the technical contract language, how they are organized on the Unreal Engine side of things. In this video that I've pulled up here, Epic responds to Apple. Epic makes the argument that Apple has six different contracts with Epic's entities, that there is another set of contracts that cover the SDKs and the Xcode in addition to the actual license agreement for the developer program. And Apple shouldn't be allowed to terminate all of those things because one team, Epic Games, breached their contract or might have breached their contract. Epic doesn't give that ground when they make the argument, right? And what we will see in this decision by Judge Rogers is that she basically agrees that the contract situation is too complicated to unwind in the fashion that Apple would do right now, but on the understanding that there are a whole lot of other issues going on. And we can, as people in virtual legality, looking at these kinds of things, tease out certain aspects of what is happening in this case. And I actually think there are a couple of good lines here to, to make certain suggestions about how the judge feels in this case right now. So looking at this particular document, it's only eight pages long, so we'll try to cover it pretty quickly. You see the background. Plaintiff Epic Games has brought this action against Apple Inc., alleging violations of the Sherman Act, California's Cartwright Act and California's unfair competition law, all which is baked in to the basic concept that Epic believes that Apple is a monopoly provider of app distribution through their iOS. Specifically, Epic Games contests Apple's in-app purchase system through which Apple takes 30% and further prevents its game, Fortnite, from offering its own IAP outside of Apple's system. Now before the court, this is what we're talking about right now, is Epic Games' motion for a temporary restraining order requesting broad relief with respect to all of its products, including those managed by affiliates, and Apple opposes the motion. Based on a preliminary review of the briefing, the court permitted a reply on the issues relating to the graphics engine, the Unreal Engine, and Apple's stated intention of revoking Epic's developer tools. That is what we talked about over the weekend. This was on Sunday that Epic actually submitted this in respect to the Unreal Engine specifically. Having carefully reviewed the party's briefing and the party's oral arguments, and for the reasons set forth more fully below, the court grants in part and denies in part 
Epic's motion for a temporary restraining order. Now, if you've been following along in virtual legality, you probably already know what the court has granted and what the court has denied because Epic's strength in their argument all lived in that Unreal Engine part of their temporary restraining order request. Then the court gives some background. Importantly here, the court makes the specification that wasn't as clear in Epic's initial request that was clarified on Sunday and was the strength of their argument that Epic Games that makes Fortnite is separate from Epic Games International, what is referred to as Epic Sorrel in the the, uh, opposition grants, and that those two documents, those two companies are different. And that's important because when you start talking about contract breach, Apple has certain rights with respect to taking action on those contracts, but not necessarily across entities. That's why you see some complicated corporate structures. I do complicated corporate structures. That's why you have an entity like a holdings company have different subsidiary companies that are then sister or brother or sibling companies that don't enter into the same contracts. And if one breaches, it isn't necessarily the case, depends on the language of the contract, that you can go and you can terminate the agreement with the other party. And the court here makes the distinction that Epic had clarified over the weekend that Epic Games is different from Epic Games International. We all know who Apple is is here. And then the court finds exactly what Epic said on Sunday. Now, the court isn't doing separate discovery here, isn't doing separate factual interrogatories here. They are only getting briefed by Apple and Epic at this point in time. Temporary restraining order is the fastest kind of thing that you can do in in the court here. And it is before even that preliminary injunction level, which in and of itself is fast. And we will see the timeline for that at the end of this document. So they have to take on a certain amount of faith that the parties are telling the truth. That's why you certify to the accuracy of the statements when you file them to the court. And the court finds here as relevant that Apple maintains separate developer agreements and developer program licensing agreements between Epic Games, Epic International, and four other Epic affiliates. Apple also maintains a separate agreement, Xcode, and the Apple SDK's agreement regarding its developer tools, which we also talked about over the weekend. Now we get some interesting language from the court. On Thursday, August 13th, 2020, Epic Games made the calculated decision to breach its allegedly illegal agreements with Apple by activating allegedly hidden code in Fortnite, allowing Epic Games to collect IAPs directly. So you see the two allegedly's there. The court doesn't make any determinations. It won't be for years that the court would make a final determination on these kinds of things. But that Epic Games made a calculated decision is not alleged. They did what they did on that morning of August 13th, the court finds. And whether or not it was hidden, whether or not the actual agreements with Apple were illegal, that's what is at play in this particular court decision overall. In response, Apple removed Fortnite from the App Store, where it remains unavailable to the date of this order. Later that same day, Epic Games filed this action and began a pre-planned and blistering marketing campaign against Apple. Again, the court finds that that is what happened. You don't see the same allegedly documentation, and everybody knows that that's what happened. We have been observing that happening in real time. The following day, Apple responded sternly. It informed Epic Games that based on its breaches of the App Store guidelines and the developer program license agreement, it would be revoking all developer tools, which would preclude updates for other programs, including the Unreal Engine. On Monday, August 17th, Epic Games filed this instant motion, the temporary restraining order request, and the next day, the parties filed a stipulation in the matter of Donald Cameron versus Apple requesting that this action be deemed a related case to Cameron. The court agreed and the matter was reassigned. Now, to give a little bit of context to that particular paragraph, Judge Rogers here is already the judge in the Cameron versus Apple case. And in that case, Cameron, and I believe it's a basketball app developer, are suing Apple for essentially the same kind of thing here, saying that Apple is a monopoly provider of access to the App Store and to the iOS in general. They don't have quite the same background. They don't necessarily want to open their own store. They want that number to come down. They don't want it to be 30% anymore. And they're arguing that before the court. And so because this particular judge was already hearing that argument, this case, Epic versus Apple, was moved over to her court going forward. It was actually originally assigned to a different judge, but it makes sense, as you can probably imagine from the organization of the court structure, to put like cases under the ambit of the same judge who's already kind of contemplating those issues and hopefully can arrive at a a more efficient solution for these cases. One thing to note is that that case was put forth in 2019 and is very likely to finish up before Epic and Apple. And so one of the things you will see here referenced in her decision is that, hey, I don't know why this happened right now, Uh, We know because Epic wants to make a big show of it. But 
either way, that Cameron case is likely to establish certain facts that are going to determine this case. And if Apple has to do certain things to change how they operate, that's also going to affect this case. So not quite sure what's going on, but let's talk about the temporary restraining order. Anyway, the legal standard for injunctive relief, as we have talked about, is a special circumstance, as described here by the court. It says, whether in the form of a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction, it is an extraordinary and drastic remedy that is never awarded as of right. It's not just a fait accompli that you get one of these. It is so well settled as to not require citation of authority that the usual function of a preliminary injunction is to preserve the status quo. A temporary restraining order is not a preliminary adjudication on the merits, but rather a device for for preserving the status quo and preventing the irreparable loss of rights before judgment. As we have talked about, this entirety of a structural component, the temporary restraining order, what will be the preliminary injunction discussion is designed to say, hey, we all understand that the court system takes a very long time. Let's figure out what would be damaged if we assume one or the other side would win in the intervening time period. If Epic Games were to win this, if they were right that the court finds that the contracts with Apple are unlawful, restraints of trade, under the Sherman Antitrust Act, and that Apple really shouldn't have even had the capability of cutting off Unreal Engine or other developer tools. Are Epic's companies, the third-party developers, are they damaged, especially if Epic will win? The answer to that, as we will see here, is yes. And very similarly, you ask the question in the opposite. If Apple were to win here, are they damaged by having to continue a relationship with Epic in a certain way or to have Fortnite removed or added back on to allow Epic to get paid directly and to otherwise support Fortnite? These are the kinds of things that come up when you are talking about one of these particular documents, one of these particular motions. And so the court says, all right, so we look at this. We evaluate the chance of success. We evaluate the chance of harm. And we balance all those things. Requests for temporary restraining orders are governed by the same general standards that govern the issuance of a preliminary injunction. In order to obtain such relief, plaintiffs must establish four factors. Likeliness to succeed. They are likely to suffer irreparable harm in the absence of this relief. The balance of equities tips in their favor. Just we think they're, they're, the harms were caused by the other side. The rightness is on your side. The wrongness is on their side. And an injunction is in the public interest. Now, it's important to note, they have a number of paragraphs, a number of precedents here, that this is a balancing test. As long as you can show all four of those things, one or the other of them can be weaker and one or the other of them can be stronger. They established that in this particular document because as we will see, the court has its issues with likeliness of success on the merits, the same kinds of issues that we have talked about at length in this series already. The court evaluates most of the factors through the lens of Apple's actions with respect to Epic Games specifically, not Epic International, including the delisting of Fortnite and other games authorized under Epic Games contract with Apple, and the anticipated suspension termination of developer rights associated or authorized under other contracts, such as the one with Epic International. So divided into two sections, Fortnite and Unreal Engine. Now we get into those factors, and there's a lot of good little things, little nuggets that we can take out of this decision already, even in this early stage. Epic brings 10 claims for violation of Sherman Act, the California Cartwright Act, and California Unfair Competition. Based on a review of the current limited record before the court, the court cannot conclude that Epic has met the high burden of demonstrating a likelihood of success on the merits, especially in the antitrust context. And that's one of those things that we talked about early on in this video series is that the Sherman Act hasn't generally been used for purposes like this one to establish a monopoly in the hardware and operating system that operates that hardware that you otherwise provide as a hardware manufacturer, and that this is a somewhat novel approach to making a monopoly claim, and that the definition of the monopoly market is going to win or lose the case at the end of the day. Now, you'll note there that they say, especially in the antitrust context, as distinct from the California context, because California, as we also talked about, generally has stricter rules on these kinds of things than even the federal law for things like antitrust. So California might come into play in a way that the federal law does not. Note, however, that the court doesn't say that Epic has no chance. They say, however, the court also concludes that serious questions do exist. For instance, you know, you sit here in virtual legality, you hear Rick say, I don't think that this market makes sense from an antitrust context. I think it is too narrow. But reasonable minds can differ and say, no, it makes perfect sense for our modern society. I know a number of you have come to my comments and said something along those lines. 
I think that that isn't how the Sherman Act has generally been adjudicated. I think there are problems with that approach. But at the end of the day, a court could decide that that narrowness of market is acceptable. And if they do decide that, then yeah, you have an antitrust violation. And I've never argued against it. If you decide that Apple is a monopoly provider of iOS access, then yeah, they're a monopoly provider of iOS access. I still think you have potential problems with their using their power unlawfully, but that market definition is where a lot of this conversation is going to lie. The court then says, hey, and also that Cameron case covers this. Indeed, the court related this action to the Cameron action because there are overlapping questions of facts and law, including substantively similar claims based on the same Apple App Store policies. Namely, the 30% fee that Apple takes from developers through each application sale and IAP in the application. The court considers this context in weighing the other factors. So right now, Epic does not have a likelihood of success on the merits. And likelihood of success is is a fairly high standard. You actually have to say to the court, hey, we are likely to win this. The court does not find that. The court says, hey, this is complicated. You can win. We're not saying Epic can't win, but there isn't any evidence that you are likely to win this thing because this is still a very complicated question. It's a novel approach to all of these legal questions. And by the way, this is all going to be dependent on another case sitting in front of my court that is probably going to finish up before yours. So we move on to the next factor, irreparable harm. The issue of irreparable harm focuses on the harm caused by not maintaining the status quo, as opposed to the separate and distinct element of a remedy under the likelihood of success factor. As they say in footnote, Indeed, the cases mentioned in passing during the August 24th, 2020 hearing, that's yesterday, and unbriefed by Epic do not appear to change this analysis. Those cases stand for the proposition that the doctrines of unclean hands in e- and in pari delicto are not recognized as a defense to antitrust claims. So one of the things that was happening here is that Epic was saying, hey, it doesn't matter if we deliberately breach this thing. If it's illegal contract, we can still go get a preliminary injunction. The court says, no. The irreparable harm question does matter for unclean hands and those kinds of things because a preliminary injunction, a temporary restraining order in advance of that preliminary injunction are separate from the underlying antitrust claim itself. So we still have to look at, did you cause this yourself? And the court will find that, of course, Epic did. Here, the court's evaluation is guided by the general notion that self-inflicted wounds are not irreparable injury. Further, courts generally decline to find irreparable harm that results from the express terms of the contract. At its core, irreparable harm is harm or injury that cannot be repaired. The court finds that with respect to Epic Games' motion as to its games, including Fortnite, Epic Games has not yet demonstrated irreparable harm. The current predicament appears one of its own making. Epic Games remains free to maintain its agreements with Apple in breach status as this litigation continues, But as the Seventh Circuit recognized in Second City Music, the sensible way to proceed is for Epic to comply with the agreements and guidelines and continue to operate while it builds a record. In other words, Epic, the normal way to do this is to just go along with the contract that you've already gone along with for the past two years, sue for antitrust, have that conversation, and not do all of this. Epic Games admits that the technology exists to fix the problem easily by deactivating the hotfix. That Epic Games would prefer not to litigate in that context does not mean that irreparable harm exists. Hey, look, Epic, you can hit a button to make this go away right now. Apple has already said they'll put Fortnite back on the store if you do so. So since that is entirely within your control, it is not the kind of thing that you can go ask the court to force. So Epic, take care of it. Then we talk about Unreal. By contrast, Epic Games has made a preliminary showing of of irreparable harm as to Apple's actions related to the revocation of the developer tools, the SDKs. The relevant agreement, the Apple X Code and Apple SDK agreement, is a fully integrated document that explicitly walls off the developer program license agreement. That's exactly what we talked about on Sunday, that this was a very good argument by Epic, that there is no cross-default concept in the X Code and SDKs agreement. Now, don't be surprised if Apple winds up adding one as a result of these kinds of situations. That how That is how contracts like that one get changed. But as of right now, they are completely walled off and that Apple doesn't really have the contractual authority to have them be used one another against each other. So what Apple is left with is a completely separate Xcode and SDKs agreement that is separate from the developer program license agreement. And even though some of the actions that were taken by Epic might otherwise hit the Xcode agreement, you have to make that case separately. You can't just say, okay, one breach over here, everything else goes away. Now, 
That may or may not be the case, depending on the language of the agreement. That's another thing that we said on Sunday, because Apple does have certain authority to declare breach under those documents. They just have to do so, and they haven't really established that case, either in their letters or their briefing to the court. As the court says on that question, Apple's reliance on its historical practice of removing all affiliated developer accounts in similar situations, or on broad language in the operative contract at issue, there is broad language in the Xcode document as we talked about, can be better evaluated with full briefing. So that's another important point in this particular aspect of the the case, right? The temporary restraining order is, I know it doesn't seem like it if you're watching from afar, but this is hard and fast law right now. This is as fast as the court can move on a question like this. And what that sentence says is, you know, maybe Apple can have a historical practice of doing this. Maybe they can act under certain broad breach language under their SDKs agreement. They haven't made that claim to the court right now. They haven't established that to the court's satisfaction. And so we can evaluate that better with more briefing. That for right now, we're going to take a month long step. We'll see the timeline at the end that says, everybody stop. Fortnite can stay off the store, but everybody else stop on the Unreal Engine and brief us on the preliminary injunction concept. Because at that point, we will better understand what exactly is going on with respect to these contracts. And we can get there and nobody's really going to be harmed for the month long period. For now, Epic International appears to have a separate developer program license agreements with Apple, and those agreements have not been breached. Moreover, Apple is hard pressed to dispute that even if Epic Games succeeded on the merits, it could be too late to save all the projects by third party developers relying on the engine that were shelved while support was unavailable. One thing to note in that particular document, and I did note it on Sunday, is that there isn't actually a third-party beneficiary clause in that contract. Ordinarily, and this wouldn't necessarily cover the court's actions in a case like this one, but ordinarily you'd have a provision in the contract that says, for the record, this is only for your benefit and for ours, and third parties aren't allowed to rely on our contractual relationship. You'd have that provision at the end of the contract in order to try to cut off at the pass arguments like this one, where you have a third-party developer that Unreal Engine is within their application that they are relying upon, Epic does something bad to you. And as we said on Sunday and Friday and every other day that we've talked about this particular case, Epic could have done something even worse than this. Apple wants to cut its ties with them. And then Epic says, well, all these other parties that are our customers are relying on access to these tools. So Apple, you can't cut us off. That ultimately is a problem for kind of normal, normalized business relationships. And it's not one that I think the court would ultimately uphold at the end of the day. But here in temporary restraining order land, It is the case that if Epic were to win and the contracts were to be illegal and Apple shouldn't be allowed to take any case, any action based on a breach of those contracts, that Epic would be harmed. And more specifically, the court is more inclined to worry about the innocence, the the detritus under the bus of these two titans that says, okay, those people that relied on the Unreal Engine, they will be harmed through no fault of their own because both Epic and Apple are acting like the tech giants that they are and beating each other in the face and allowing everybody else to die under their feet. The court doesn't like that. And that's really one of the things that I think really held uh, held forth for the court in this particular question. Indeed, such a scenario, were Epic to win at the end of the day, would, lead le- would likely lead to nebulous, hard-to-quantify questions such as how successful these other projects might have been had none of this happened, and how much in royalties would have been generated, much less the collateral damage to the third-party developers themselves. It would be very difficult to unwind that, and I think the court's right there. Then we talk about the balance of equities. The battle between Epic Games and Apple has apparently been brewing for some time. It is not clear why now became so urgent. The Cameron case, which addresses the same issues, has been pending for over a year, and yet both Epic Games and Apple remain successful market players. If plaintiffs there or here prevail, monetary damages will be available, and injunctive relief requiring a change in practice, Apple's practice, will likely be required. Epic Games moves this court to allow it to access Apple's platform for free while it makes money on each purchase made on the same platform. While the court anticipates experts will opine that Apple's 30% take is anti-competitive, the court doubts that an expert would suggest a 0% alternative. Not even Epic Games gives away its products for free. There is a lot of important stuff here. So the court has already been adjudicating this Cameron case. It hasn't gotten any further than the preliminary type stuff for over a year. So that should give you a kind of notion of the timeline that Epic versus Apple is on. But the court notes that Hey, experts are going to opine on various things. The court has experts in 
Apple and Epic are going to fight over 30% and they're going to say, oh, the market should be 20% and they're going to have this fight. But one thing that is not going to happen, the court says pretty clearly, is that Epic isn't going to be allowed to have Fortnite on the iOS app store and Apple makes nothing, right? One of the main arguments that Epic has put forth in their original court filing and in their temporary restraining order is that they should be allowed to have their own Epic game store that Apple doesn't get a cut out of and or that they should be allowed to have this direct payment option in Fortnite, which sitting next to the Apple option, nobody would pick and Apple wouldn't make a dime on Fortnite being made available through their store. The court says, well, they expect experts to argue that 30% is too high and the court may or may not take up that action because again, we should be reluctant to have random experts sitting in a courtroom or even a judge change market terms without good reason that this is all going to take a long time to unwind. She doubts that anybody is going to come in here and say that Epic should just be allowed to use the iOS for free. So that's an important notion and really dovetails with the entire concept that the court doesn't find that there is a high likelihood of success on the merits overall. Thus, in focusing on the status quo, the court observes that Epic Games strategically chose to breach its agreements with Apple, which changed the status quo. No equities have been identified suggesting that the court should impose a new status quo in favor of Epic Games. By contrast, switching over to the Unreal Engine, with respect to the Unreal Engine and the developer tools, the court finds the opposite result. In this regard, the contracts related to those applications were not breached. Apple does not persuade that it will be harmed based on any restraint on removing the developer tools. The party's dispute is easily cabined on the antitrust allegations with respect to the App Store. It need not go further. Apple has chosen to act severely and by doing so has impacted non-parties and a third-party developer ecosystem. In this regard, the equities do weigh against Apple. So even if we don't think Epic will win, even if we think Epic is a bad actor, even if we think Epic breached its agreement, it is very difficult to unwind this if Epic were to win and Apple didn't need to take this step. So the court says, okay, from an equitable principle standpoint, Apple, what are you really harmed by allowing the Unreal Engine ecosystem to survive? And Apple makes the argument that says, court, we shouldn't be forced to do business with those that we don't want to do business with. And the court says, yeah, okay, we will look at that at the preliminary injunction level. But for right now, let's have a month long pause. Then we talk about public interest. And this is some of the stuff that I know a number of you came into my comments and argued with me about when I said things like the Twitters weren't very useful to the court and, and et cetera, et cetera. The public interest inquiry primarily addresses the impact on non-parties. With respect to the gaming requests, the court recognizes based on the numerous internet postings and comments submitted in the record that Fortnite players are passionate supporters of the game and eagerly anticipate its return to the iOS platform. The court has officially recognized that Fortnite fans are Fortnite fans and that they're passionate about Fortnite. So you can put this on t-shirts, maybe Epic will sell this particular finding of the court. Fortnite players are passionate supporters. Nobody can be accused of being false Fortnite fans. The court further recognizes that during these coronavirus pandemic times, virtual escapes may assist in connecting people and providing a space that is otherwise unavailable. However, the showing is not sufficient to conclude that these considerations outweigh the general public interest in requiring private parties to adhere to their contractual agreements or in resolving business disputes through normal, albeit expedited, proceedings. In other words, that's all very well and good. People like Fortnite. Yes, people need to connect through video games. That's all well and good as well. However, you had a contract. You deliberately breached it. The court's going to find that that's more important than the folks that really like to shoot bananas. With respect to the Unreal Engine and the developer tools, the calculus changes. The record shows potential significant damage to both the Unreal Engine platform itself and to the gaming industry generally, including on both third-party developers and gamers. The public context in which this injury arises differs significantly. Not only has the underlying agreement not been breached, but the economy is in dire need of increasing avenues for creativity and innovation, not eliminating them. So there's a little bit of extra added to these kinds of things, and it's not something that I've talked about prior to the series. This is one of those reasons why I say you can never guess what a judge is going to find important. You should never tell your client if you're in law school, if you're a lawyer already sitting in front of you, that you can guarantee what a judge will do. The judge clearly finds as at least important to this discussion the current 2020 situation that 
if this weren't 2020 and if this wasn't kind of a, a, an apocalypse of a certain kind in which digital gaming has actually proven a reprieve, then maybe the argument wouldn't be as strong and Apple could take stronger actions. But here in 2020, under coronavirus, this is something that the court should look askance at, at least at the temporary restraining order level, because so many are dependent on this. And maybe also because so many are dependent on not potentially losing their jobs, losing whatever it is that they've been building over the course of many years. That's part of the video game development cycle is you choose your engine and you actually have to develop with it for a long time. And to lose that support now is unfair to them. There's no question that it is. Regardless of how I or you or anybody else feels about Epic's underlying case, just a third-party developer that chose Unreal Engine for iOS three years ago, getting close to the finish line and finding out that Epic is no longer going to be able to support that tool set is is bad. That's unfair. And the court doesn't like unfairness if it can be avoided. Epic Games and Apple are at liberty to litigate against each other, but their dispute should not create havoc to bystanders. Certainly during the period of a temporary restraining order, the status quo in this regard should be maintained. So again, you have a little bit of hedging there, right? At the end of this particular statement, it's okay. Temporary restraining orders are different than even preliminary injunctions. Pause. I think a lot of people are reporting that this is definitive one way or the other on these ultimate questions. It certainly isn't. If anything, what the court says here is that unwinding the unreal aspect of all of this, and I do think the Microsoft statement was helpful to Epic in this regard, to see Microsoft say, hey, look, we can't even choose Unreal Engine if we don't know whether it's going to survive. I put up Senwa from their their new game, uh, from Ninja Theory, and Microsoft saying that to the court, I think, was very helpful to Epic in, in that regard. But at the end of the day, the court is basically saying, pause. For the stuff that's really tricky, we need to look at this more fulsomely. We can't just do this in a week. Weighing of factors. The court finds that based upon the record before it, the winter factors, the factors in favor of a temporary restraining order slash preliminary injunction, weigh against granting a temporary restraining order based on Epic Games request as to Fortnite and other games, and in favor of granting a temporary restraining order based on to the Unreal Engine and other affected developer tools. Now, one of the interesting things here, so this is the actual injunction slash temporary restraining order that was granted by the court here is that it's actually too broad. And we're going to talk about that even for the logic of the court. This happens. As I said, this is hard and fast law. So we can see what they actually did here, which was essentially what Epic requested in their initial request for a restraining order. Therefore, Apple and all persons in active concert or participation with Apple are temporarily restrained from taking adverse action against Epic Games with respect to restricting, suspending, or terminating any affiliate of Epic Games, such as Epic International, from Apple's developer program, including as to Unreal Engine, on the basis that Epic Games enabled in-app payment processing in Fortnite through means other than IAP or on the basis of the steps Epic took to do so. Now, there's a whole lot to unwind here. But one thing that makes it overbroad is the notion that Apple can't take adverse action against Epic Games, right? Epic Games makes Fortnite, at least as the court has defined here, versus Epic International, which makes Unreal Engine. And the one thing that the court has suggested is that Epic Games probably breached its contract. Now, whether or not it's illegal or not, that means that Epic Games breaching its contract should be the kind of thing that Apple can probably respond to. The court's reactions here, the description of events, all relates to the fact that this was a separate contract and that Unreal Engine is more important than Fortnite. That doesn't actually apply to Fortnite or Epic Games itself. So by taking the language that Epic offered, I think Epic actually got a little bit of a half-stolen base from what the court's logic actually would dictate here. I would have expected this when I got to the end of this document to say something along the lines of, you can't do anything to Epic International, you can't do anything specifically aimed at Unreal Engine, But instead, they took Epic's language, which, remember, was baked into this whole notion that Fortnite goes back and Apple can't do anything against us because we're in the right, we're going to win this case, and the court should back us up in that. The court finds that we're not sure you're going to win this case. The court finds that you don't make a good claim of irreparable harm on the Fortnite breach. You don't make a good claim for public interest on Fortnite, and then yet uses the third paragraph almost in its entirety because this is happening in real time. This is happening very fast. And the unfortunate aspect of that, if you are Apple, is that it becomes very difficult to say what it is you can and can't do. Can Apple cut off Epic Games from the PLA, the developer program right now? I would say that they can't. 
even though the court finds that Apple's fine in taking Fortnite down off the store as breach of contract. And if that is a breach of contract, Apple should be allowed to take that action. Similarly, you have an opposite end problem here, right? By actually putting this in and not restraining Epic's actions at all, you create a problem. Because one thing that Apple has said is, Epic, we welcome you back with open arms if you take Fortnite's direct payment option off and we can put you back in the store. So Epic could take it off. Apple says, great, we're putting it back in the store. And then they flip the switch right back on. At which point, this particular restriction says you aren't allowed to do anything, any adverse action against Epic Games with respect to Epic Games enabling in-app processing in Fortnite. So if Epic really wanted to be a bad actor, and we have a lot of indications that they like to be, for lack of a better term, legal trolls on these questions, Epic could sit back and say, all right, flip the switch to off and then put it back on the store and then flip the switch to on. And then what can Apple do under this particular court order? Now, Apple would very likely immediately ask the court for special dispensation, say that Epic has very unclean hands on this kind of thing, and Epic would probably get smacked in the nose with the newspaper by the judge, say, no, you can't do that. Obviously, the spirit of this particular action is that Fortnite stays off, Unreal comes back, and if you continue to act in this way, we're going to have to revisit that whole Unreal Engine thing. But Epic might right? It's not every company that has a marketing plan and a federal case ready to go when their video game is removed from an app store. And by giving them this particular language, I would be concerned if I were Apple that Epic will try to play some games. Because the alternative is Apple looks at this and says, even if Epic turns it off or agrees to turn off the direct payment option, Apple says, we're not putting it back on the store. Epic says, you said you would. The court acted really on the premise that we could do that. Honestly, we didn't get that temporary restraining order to some extent because language in the court decision itself said, well, you can fix this with a change on your own. We have decided to do that. And now if Apple doesn't put us back, maybe we can make a claim against the court that you have unclean hands and maybe we can get a little bit of a victory there. And Apple could say, but the language you won puts us in the very bind that we just talked about in this video. So I look at this and I say, it makes sense. This is the reason why Epic puts forward the language that they did is to say, court, you just have to adopt this. You just copy paste this right there. If you could just copy paste that in, we'll be all set. Thank you very much, court. Court really does. There's a few changes here with respect to active concert or participation that covers the same ground that the Epic proposal did. But by only taking half of their proposed temporary restraining order, they've created logic holes that are likely to be a problem, at least in strategic decision making for Apple and Epic today, if not into the future and left this up for grabs through the preliminary injunction time frame. And we see here at the end that throughout September, these parties will be briefing the preliminary injunction component. Now, I don't know, and you can leave a comment to this video if you are interested in these kinds of things. I don't know if we're going to cover, you know, another four documents in this in September. We will certainly cover the final kind of preliminary injunction discussion, uh, especially the judge's determination on those things. But I don't know how interested you are in going over every little bit of those documents, which are very likely to mirror large sections of the temporary restraining order fight. But if you are, let me know in the comments to this video and we will cover that. The next big date for this particular case is September 28th, which could of course get moved, court dockets get moved all the time, but is currently slated for the end of September and a decision on that preliminary injunction probably issue shortly thereafter, probably first week of October, I would guess, but it all depends on what the court slate is. As of right now, however, the situation is that Apple is restrained from taking any adverse action against Epic or its affiliates related to this specific breach. And that raises the number of questions that I've already stated. It also raises one final question. As we've talked about in this space, Apple still has the right to terminate its developer program entry for any reason or no reason at all. It's what we call a termination for convenience clause. They issue notice uh, that it'll happen in 30 days. And after that notice period has expired, they can terminate without a reason whatsoever. One of the questions that might happen here is that they say, okay, well, since you've asked for this on the basis that Epic Games enabled in-app payment processing language in your actual restraint, Apple can say, well, we're not going to terminate you on that basis. We're going to terminate you on no basis. And just like the other things that we've described in this video, the court might take offense to that. But at the end of the day, the court is likely to enforce 
the rights of the parties to do what they want to do under their contract. Now, we've got a pending antitrust lawsuit. We've got Unreal Engine developers that are at issue. We've got all this other stuff. There is a lot, a lot more to come, as you can probably tell just from the discussion of open questions and question marks at the end of this video. And we will very much see where it goes here in virtual legality. If you enjoyed this video, thank you so much for checking it out. Please like, subscribe, share, tell folks that we are here having these conversations. We have obviously covered Epic versus Apple a lot. Epic versus Google might wind up bubbling up at some point as well. And we are talking about this and everything else in business and law through the prisms of the pop culture, video games, music movies, and television that you otherwise love to talk about already. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. 